Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the NID uh, Plan for Water meeting of 2023. We've made a lot of great progress and looking forward to another really interesting and exciting year. So um, with that, we will start with um, the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, President Hull, and congratulations on your new position on the board. Very exciting. And um, Board Member Calder, welcome. This is your first official Plan for Water meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Look forward to it. You've already contributed a lot, so you're not going to have a big catch-up here. That's great. So as always, we'll do a quick process check-in. As the board and the public are aware, we do have the Plan for Water matrix. I do just want to point out that once we started to get into the technical details of stages six and seven, I'm sorry, seven and eight, we realized that it was not, um, it, it didn't make the most sense to go in kind of this progression order that we had identified in the matrix. So for reasons to allow the consultant team to move forward with their work in an efficient manner, we are going to be addressing some of the demand assumptions today and the consultant team will be providing a presentation. I will go ahead and update the matrix to reflect that so that the public can also track where we are at in the process. So there will be a little bit of combining of stages seven, which is hydrology and hydrography and stage eight, which is demand. And just a couple of housekeeping items, if anybody from the public, as President Hull indicated, you may participate in a number of manners. You can raise your hand. Um, members of the public that are in the room, just either wave me down or just walk up to the podium and we'll get you in as soon as possible. And for ease for our members online, you may also use the chat function. And we will um, sneak your comment in as soon as we can. And with that, we have nothing else related to the matrix, unless there's any questions. So, Jennifer, for clarity, is, will you be kind of alternating between hydro item seven, hydrology, hydrography, and demand, and kind of as you get more information or more issues uh, discussed, you'll be, you know, kind of moving between the two, or are we doing demand first? We'll be moving between the two a little bit. We do have somewhat of a strategy lined out, and it might be worth sharing that with the board and the public. Um, strategy in terms of? The items that we're going to be visiting in future meetings. Okay. Um, so, obviously, before we've had some discussions about the, hy the hydrology model. We had those discussions. Now today we're going to be talking about the demand input and the demand model that we're recommending to use, some of the assumptions, et cetera, with that. And then we'll be coming back and then we'll actually be taking a look at the model um, and have a presentation on that. We talked about that here in the near future um, so you can get a better feel what that starts to look like, some of the different pieces of the model of bring it back to bring to the board, um, some of the information and the output of those models as we start to develop those. 
Same with this man will be coming back. Having various discussions about stuff that like Katie will be talking about um, and different things like that. We'll be kind of bouncing back and forth. I think that's a great approach because it gives us a chance to get more public input and mm -hmm. to think about things between, absent having to make a decision or stopping the process. So yeah, because they're working on both of them, right? At yeah. the same time, times where there's things the modeling are doing, which is relatively boring to the rest of us, but needs to get done in the background and then we can present different stages. Perfect. I think it will keep us moving at a little bit more of an efficient clip. With that, is there anything else regarding the process and the matrix? Anything anyone would like to see added to the current plan? And just as a point of information for the board and the public, we did hold a small, um, more of a focused stakeholder group meeting regarding the information that we pr are presenting today. And that was to allow for some feedback at that meeting, but also to help us understand things we need to address at this meeting, um, and also to give them a preview of the information that is being talked about today, to let them have a little bit more time to make comments if they feel necessary to do so. When did you do that? December right. 21st. Yeah, right before Christmas. Oh, right before Christmas. Mm -hmm. okay. And well, was it the same? Not the same. But was it the same group of stakeholders that's been kind of involved all the way along? Correct. Oh, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. On agricultural demand on root death. So we're not getting into that detail yet. <laughs> but I want you. To, I want you to. I want to know. I want to. I just want to point out what happened in the valley was that when people went to micro sprinklers like I did in 1993 the groundwater was not recharged. So it has a significant impact on a recharge of groundwater when you only irrigate down to root depth. So, okay. And, that, and that's part of the problem the valleys have right now. There's no recharge. Perfect. And I think with that, are we ready to get started? I think so. Okay. You want to introduce your team? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the demand model today. Um, and we've got West, uh, the, the team here. we got Marco, which is with West Consultants, and Katie, which is with David's Engineering. Katie's going to have the discussion. So David's is the one that's developing the demand model and the input and stuff associated with that. So she's going to give us a presentation that you have in the packet. And this is obviously iterative, so if you have questions, raise your hand. You don't necessarily have to wait till the end. Um, we'll just have the presentation with Katie, and then we'll go from there. It works for everybody. And please don't feel that it's necessary to wait till the end of the presentation to ask questions or to make comments, and that goes for the board as well as for the public. Thank you all for having us today. I'm going to provide, as we just noted, a presentation about the demand model component of the plan for water process. So with that, I'll get to our agenda today. Um, could you, could you, can you scoot? Oh, yeah. yeah. Scoot that right next to you. Right. I'm going to move this closer to you, too. Okay. Okay, yes. Sorry. I get a little quiet sometimes. Uh, all right. Well, with the agenda, um, just to start out, we'll be starting with an introduction to demand modeling and what that generally entails, what's included in demand, and then uh, move on to talking more about the specific demand model that we're developing for the Nevada Irrigation District, um, including the general approach, and then just focusing on some of the key inputs to the model that warrant maybe more discussion, whereas there's um, a lot of other inputs that are all kind of captured in that giant matrix and the PDF that um, was distributed. So um, that provides a more comprehensive look at the, the demand model inputs, but we'll just talk about some of the highlights today. And then finally, we'll talk about next steps and then get on to discussion and questions. Um, but of course, feel free to interrupt and you know, if you have questions along the way, uh, by all means. So starting with an introduction to demand modeling, um, I want to first start out by um, confirming that we all have a common understanding of what demand entails. Demand can mean different things in different contexts. Um, in this particular context, uh, we're considering demand um, consistent with the previous plan for water efforts, 
um, to be the volume of water that's needed to satisfy water users' needs. Um, and that includes a number of different water users, which we'll get into on the next slide, but just to kind of highlight two big ones um, here are you know, agricultural demand and urban demand. And um, they both depend on a lot of factors. Agricultural demand, of course, depends on crops and land uses, on what's happening, how much water do, uh, do those need. Um, irrigation methods, you know, are those efficient? Or is there opportunity for maybe reducing demand when it comes to irrigation methods? And just, you know, what are trends happening over time? Climate, of course, um, is it getting warmer? Is there less precipitation? Maybe that increases demand for irrigation. And then also soils, you know, different soils have different water holding properties, and that also impacts um, on the urban side, two big ones are going to be population and per capita water use. You know, how many people are needing water and how much are they using, right? Um, and then, of course, climate also factors into demand as well. So um, demand, just to reiterate, um, is the water needed for customers and environmental requirements, and that's what we're trying to capture in this demand model. Um, those customers, um, including you know, raw water customers, treated water customers, as well as muni municipal users, um, on the environmental side, we have those environmental flow requirements, so that's another piece of demand. And then finally, there's also this element of system losses, which while in and of themselves aren't necessarily a, um, a demand per se, it is, you know, the water that's needed to get water where it needs to go, right? And so maybe there's opportunities for reducing that component of demand. Oh, yes, by all means. Yeah, hi. A question. So the total use of water mm -hmm. in California, could you divide it up between urban, agricultural, environmental percentage-wise? Oh, across all of California. I don't know if I have that off offhand, but I, yeah, I don't I don't know that we have that offhand, but we could look into that and send you some resources. Uh, well, the Farm Bureau did a study. Mm -hmm. um, they came up with urban eight percent, mm -hmm. agriculture forty one percent, environmental fifty one percent, and that was a couple years ago, as I remember reading it. Mm -hmm. So. I just want to keep that in perspective as we talk about demand and a baseline where we're at right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. It's interesting to know how the definition of environmental water within that construct that mm -hmm. you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And is that of all the water that falls on land? Mm -hmm. not, not just the developed water? Debbie's right. here. Because that's all we get. I didn't here. do the study, but I remember reading it. Wow. Okay. So it was a couple years ago those numbers came up. Uh, so typically for developed water, it'd be about 70 to 75 percent mm -hmm. roughly is agriculture, and the rest would be urban. That's kind of what I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. right. my, my focus is really keeping those two separate because media is great on on doing that because of the developed water part versus you know, that, the total water that falls in the Right. And those figures have been out there, 80 percent 80 for agriculture, 20 percent for urban, but that really in reality is not what's happening. Um, and take and take the uh, water trans not the water transfers voluntary agreements all the environmental flows through the delta unimpaired flows and it starts to be added up uh, a lot of water is going to the environment so for not the purposes of this discussion we will include any environmental water in stream flows into our demand model so that will be captured specific to NID and our service territory that's helpful because looking at the state, it, for me, it's hard to aggregate what, mm -hmm. how does that actually apply to our district? And so what you're proposing would um, make that a general comment specific to our district so that we know what our environmental re flow requirements are as part of the total. And contribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. we're contributing now. We are. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions at this point? And let's just check in with the. We have no comments either from our friends at home. How do you uh, look at system losses? What, what's the foundation for system losses within the calculation? Yeah, absolutely. I'll get into that in a slide or okay. two. Um, but but it's um, basically a conveyance system balance is kind of the where that comes into play. Right. So what's, you know, the inflows and outflows there. Great. Um, and then I guess just to wrap up on this slide, the last bullet there. Um, so, you know, the demand model has, um, starts out with a historical component, just to be sure that the structure of the demand model is accurately reflecting what's going on 
um, in the Nevada Irrigation District. But then ultimately, I mean, the plan for water process is looking toward the future, right? And so, um, you know, we're also developing a projected model then um, and looking at different scenarios of what you know, might happen in the future so that we can plan for what might happen in the future. And I think at this point it's um, maybe just important to note that this is a planning model um, but not a predictive model. So, you know, while we're, um, you know, proposing multiple different scenarios of what could happen, I mean, it's by no means, you know, it may not happen. You know, one of those could happen. Um, so there's, you know, an opportunity, you know, five years, then there's a future to maybe update, you know, the model based on what we've learned over the last five years and maybe check in annually, right, to um, to just kind of see where we're at relative to what, you know, the different scenarios we, you know, considered could happen, um, you know, where we are relative to that. And, and we and we chatted about that a little bit before, right, which is talked about for the basis of the plan, how often we're going to look at updating it and have that yearly discussion with the board and then look at every five years of doing that to make sure that we're on track or if we need to make adjustments because it's, uh, it's quite different than what we had projected. Well, it's not unlike our matrix we were just talking about. There's the idea, there's the plan. Yeah. Well, and one of the challenges with demand is it fluctuates largely year to year based off of actual weather conditions. So when it starts raining, you know, come the fall time frame, and then how soon does it get hot? How long does it stay hot for? That really drives your outdoor water use. Indoor municipal water use is a fairly small, small portion of our overall demands. And it really is that outdoor use, which is very much weather driven. So I do caution people from getting too wrapped around a set of demand numbers based off of one single calendar year, because there are many things that influence them. And that's really why we're kind of taking this longer term look. So are the inputs set for if something changes, you might take a whole brand new input? Uh, yeah, the inputs are very configurable. Uh, so we'll get into a little bit more about um, kind of the, the what it's called the IDC model, um, which is like the model structure for looking at the land surface. And it has um, many different inputs that are configurable. So if you know conditions change a couple years down the road, you know maybe precipitation, precipitation or population or land use, those are all discrete inputs that are very easy to change. We need to have you speak into the speaker oh, more. I'm a into the microphone. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Um, so then moving on to the next slide, so this is um, where we kind of start getting into what um, the proposed um, method for quantifying demand, so really getting into the demand model itself. And so the overall demand model, we kind of see it as two pieces, basically. There's the land surface or root zone water balance side, um, which is um, basically a physical model of what's happening on the land surface. You know, where, is, or where are urban areas being developed? Where is um, agricultural land being developed? You know, what are the crops on that agricultural land? So physically, what is happening on the land surface that's really driving demand? And, um, and that, you know, that's the model um, I just was mentioning, to get into on the next slide, um, is where you know, those inputs related to, to rooting depth or you know, land use, where that comes into play and that, um, that can be adapted over time as you know, conditions change, perhaps. Um, then that gets tied to the conveyance system balance, which is where the, the system losses kind of come into play. So we know, you know once we put our finger on um, how much water is needed on the land surface, we can tie that back to um, conveyance system and understand then what, you know, what outflows were needed to, to, to provide those demands, back that up toward the reservoirs to understand kind of what inflows were needed, um, and then tie that to the reservoir side of the, the plan for water process model. So. Can you talk a little bit more about the first bullet point? So you're, you're, you're looking simply at, or not simply, it's I'm sure very complicated, but you're looking more solely at what the land is like, mm -hmm. then determining, then then from where where do you go from there? I mean, because we don't we have a lot of um, non-irrigated land currently. Mm -hmm. So how do you look at what we currently uh, support mm -hmm. with water delivery, and what is not currently accessing? our system, but may want to. Mm -hmm. How do you look at that? Well, yeah, that's, I think, where those different um, scenarios and the projected model come into play, right? We'll have um, basically um, several 
different potential future cases where maybe land use um, changes a bit. Maybe there's a bit more urban development around, um, you know, around the cities, and maybe um, agricultural, you know, crops change a bit, or maybe there's some expansion. So that goes into the the scenarios um, in the projected model. And um, I haven't talked about it yet, but the the land surface water balance side of the model that ties to um, to parcel level spatial data. So basically, as we, you know, if we understand that um, maybe from zoning that, you know, that urban development is likely to happen in this area, then we can simulate that um, within the model and, you know, tie that directly in that spatial context. And, and I think also, you know, that's where the soft surface areas start to come into play, right? When we look at a canal and we see what these areas aren't being served, but could potentially be served, assuming they get access across a neighbor's property, et cetera, versus some areas that they're will most likely never get water to those locations. Right. So it's the soft service area that will help us kind of get an idea where we think some of that growth could occur as well. So Doug, I might have this wrong in my memory bank, but what I remember from the prior plans and water effort is that the figures around this soft service area were, in my opinion, um, overstated. And so I, I just want to, you know, where's the, where's the bookend on this? I mean, because we really, I mean, it's not feasible to provide either treated or raw water to every area of the district. It's just not going to happen. So absolutely, and that's part of the, the overall bookend discussions that we've had, right? Where we'll, we'll pick a worst case and a best case scenario, which are most not probable options and then to figure out what makes the most sense within there and then that's when we start to have these little more specific discussions with the group with regards to here's what we see as a potential soft service area okay you know yes or no kind of thing here's a here's a worst case here's the best case and it lies somewhere in between and that's where we start to dial that in and then ultimately feedback from from the public and board in terms of what makes the most sense to include in the Okay. And I assume that a primary driver of that defining of the soft service area is what is economically feasible. Yeah, correct. It's it's economically feasible. What makes sense, you know, obviously going down and then back up another slope and over the top is probably not something that's going to happen. But perhaps, you know, within a, a few thousand feet of a canal, depending on the slopes, et cetera, it may make sense, especially if they're bigger parcels. You get access across one or two parcels. You know, you may run 1,500 feet of pipe. That's like at my house. That's about what I have. Um, but then you can get access to it. You're not know, having to pump it and create these big monstrosity type of systems. Yeah. And and remember, in the creation of the scenarios that Katie's referencing, it is very important to, you know, people tend on both sides of the coin. We have people who are very worried about not having enough water. There's people that are extremely worried about NID proposing to construct new storage. Those are not the only answers, right? So when it is important that we kind of look at the scenarios and do kind of get the most conservative scenario and the least conservative scenario, because what it will allow you to do is complete some planning. For example, with the soft service areas, if we look at it and say, okay, this it raises our demand. If we plan to connect all of these soft service areas to the system, raises our demand by 25%. Well, the board could come back and say, well, one of our strategies is not to complete raw water expansions. You know, that could be a strategy to address future demand needs. So I do think it's important to that we are open to all of the potential scenarios so that it allows us to really evaluate all the potential solutions. In that scenario, the hypothetical of 25% expansion. And it was, that was completely made up. I know. Okay. <laughs> um, do you include with that a cost estimate to expand that service? You know, assuming, let's assume we've got the supply, we want to, what would it cost to expand to that soft service area? It, for the potential strategies, we could come up with some high-level costs, but costs on new connections, specifically on canals, is really dependent on the actual area in which we're expanding in. What I also think is an important part of that conversation is the number of customers per linear feet 
of treated water pipeline and canal from a maintenance and operation perspective. Mm -hmm. Because the more that I review the district's finances, we have a lot of lines that don't necessarily have enough customers mm -hmm. to pay for either the ongoing maintenance and operation or the future capital replacement. And so, you know, as you continue to add on those types of infrastructure where they're always in this revenue deficit simply because of the number of people, at some point you have to start making decisions based off of is it financially feasible, not just from a construction perspective, but also from a long-term maintenance operation perspective. That's right. And, and that would just be my interest to make sure that that element is included in the discussion so that it's not in isolation because – I mean, heck, who among us wouldn't want to see a 25% growth or 50% growth? Yeah, but it's at a cost. We need to understand the cost and the benefit at the same time. And, and so part of that, too, realizes that some of that soft service area doesn't require us to install new facilities. It's just mm -hmm. the ability for somebody to connect to an existing canal. Yeah. Right? And then yeah. utilizing okay. that when we start to design for culverts or encasements, et cetera, to be able to handle the volume that we need, assuming... Mm -hmm. a certain amount of self-service connection. Yeah. I wouldn't conflate the two issues, right? Those are really strategy mm -hmm. policy issues for expansion and long-term financial sustainability of the district. For the purposes of demand, the real question is going to be, what is reasonable connections to the self-service area? What is the reasonable absorption rate in which we think those folks would possibly connect? And that also applies to treated water. I'm not as concerned about treated water because the water use is somewhat nominal in consideration of our raw water use, but it's the same conversation. What is the reasonable absorption rate of new treated water connections and new raw water connections in the self-service area? Because that will also drive your demand over time. So we get that first, and then we can talk about <coughs> strategizing uh, the cost benefit, you know, cost analysis to do that, right? Make expansion. Mm -hmm. A separate conversation. It, it is a separate conversation, but I just want to make sure the expectation is understood that in the plan for water process, we're talking in the, you know, in phase 10, the strategy options. Those are really high level conversation. So what we're hoping is to say at the end of this, um, we will need, and I'm making up numbers again, zero additional <laughs> supply or 50% X additional supply. And here's all the ways that we could get to that, whether it be through conservation, moratorium on new connections. Um, you could even, the board could even go so far as, um, you know, abandoning non-functioning or inefficient canals. Not that you would do that. But, <laughs> and then we'll look at all those strategies and then we'll rank them based off of the fiscal feasibility, the legal feasibility, the environmental impact, um, the political feasibility, and then the board can start pulling policy decisions out of that effort. A lot of feasibilities. It is, but the, that that work is going to be important to tier into the master planning effort for raw, raw water, treated water, in the watershed. Mm -hmm. President Hall, you seem... I, yeah, I still have a question mark on my forehead. Um, because I want to make sure I understand this, because I think it's very important um, what we are going to end up with with the demand, but sometimes I'm ahead of the, you know, where I should be in the conversation too. So maybe I should just pause and let the time continue. I do, I do think though that determining a demand number absent the cost, a rough estimate of the cost, I get it, without that, then I don't know how you, I don't know how you do that. I mean, your, the idea is you have a demand bookend. Mm -hmm. You have a demand that is, you know, on the lower end because we're very conservative in how new connections or the soft service territories are going to be increased and how the temperature is going to change over time with climate change and how much more or how much less water we're going to get. And then you have the high, the high end that says, you know, it's going to be hot. 10 months out of the year 
and we're anticipating having to increase the raw water season and all these soft ser service territories are going to connect. And then from there, it's really a policy decision because it's a question of risk. What risk is the board comfortable with taking? And then we will identify where the board's comfort level is for planning for additional demand and supply needs somewhere within those bookends. Okay. And you could pick one of the bookends if you so choose to. I don't necessarily think that from a planning perspective, it's good to plan for the absolute best case scenario that we're going to have all the water we need and there's going to be no problems and climate change isn't going to change anything we know today. Get rid of the 20%. Essentially, hit the middle. but that's really where the boards, you know, that's where the tough work comes in is what is your risk tolerance? Thank you. That helps. Oh, do we have another question? Okay. Anybody before we move on? All right. And we have no, oh, we have one question. Um, this is from Amanda from Sierra Harvest. Is system losses incorporating evaporation from the NID ditches, or how are system losses calculated? Perhaps this will be detailed later in the presentation, and I believe that it is. Um, it, you know, I think it's in the matrix, but okay. um, not in this presentation here. Um, but, but basically, yes, it includes, you know, seepage and evaporation and um, you know, other any tail losses. So, um, I'm sorry. I, I still can't hear, and I know Rich can't hear. I'm, I'm, so I'm when I go how many this way. Can hear. I know. <laughs> you can pull a little closer. Okay. I'm so sorry. No, it's it's me. It's my. I'm just no, quiet. <laughs> a little quiet. I'm Let's sorry. See if I can do this without pulling everything off. It's you. <laughs> oh, no. No. I think this is connected to that, right? Yeah. Okay. There. Okay. Um, my apologies. I was just I, I said that um that system losses are not included in this rest of this presentation, though they are in the matrix that we sent out. And um that basically yes includes evaporation, um, percolation or seepage from canals and um uh, tail losses. So there, is there uh, like scientific research on that? What the those system losses that you described? And how do you how do you count? How do you quantify it? Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, percolation, seepage. I mean, that um, is really affected by um, you know, an unlined canals soil types, right? I mean, different soils have different um, you know they pass water differently, correct? Um, and evaporation. I mean, that's driven um, by the, you know what the open canal surface is and what you know the um, kind of environmental conditions around are. You know, how much water is being taken up into the air. So, um, so yes, there are there are standard approaches for for getting at those numbers. And then, um, yes. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Um, with that, then I'll move on to the next slide. So this gets into um, digging a little bit deeper into the um, land surface water balance or root zone balance side of the land model. Um, what we're proposing to you is called the um, Integrated Water Flow Demand Calculator, which reduces down to IDC. Um, this is a model that has been developed by the California Department of Water Resources, and it's widely used across California. Um, it's very well, um, you know, um, also well um, supported by the Department of Water Resources. So, you know, for the next, you know, however long this model is being used, California Department of Water Resources is still, you know, maintaining that. So it's, um, you know, a good option, I think, for a long-term planning tool. Um, the IDC model does simulate those physical processes on the land surface. So it looks, it looks at, you know, with um, certain assumptions about um, land coverage, um, crops that might be in the area, um, you know, development of urban areas. Um, it takes all of that into account with information about soils and you know all the other things that impact demand, and then physically simulates what the demand would be under those um, circumstances. And also just to note, you know, IDC, as I mentioned before, is um, widely used for different agricultural um, and also just you know other planning studies across California, um, including a recent one in El Dorado County. And also, um, it's been used widely for um, groundwater sustainability planning, which are the, you know other 50-year plans um, that have been developed all across California. And um, IDC is the leading um, demand component for those planning studies. Um, and also just to highlight, you know, there are lots of things happening on the, um, the surface, and you know, those are physically modeled in IDC. Um, and we'll get into a bit of what you know goes into these different inflows and outflows. But um, just wanted to, to kind of 
show you that you know the land surface um, is being modeled you know from you know inflows on the surface as well as inflows from the atmosphere and inflows from you know the groundwater system. So it's you know a comprehensive look at the land surface. Can I ask, please? Mm -hmm. um, so in this demand calculation, demand the IDC mm -hmm. demand calculator, um, are you folks able to put in um, essentially input specific to our region, soil type, yes. fracture rock? So on, so on, kind of crops are grown. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yep. That's ex yep. And that's exactly why we've um we you know re are recommending it and why it's so widely used is that um, so many of the the inputs are very configurable to the unique local local setting. And then where do you get the input information? Um, from a from? yeah, from a variety of places. I mean, we have um, precipitation data that comes from um, Prism, um, which you know we're linking together with other parts of the the plan for water modeling process. Um, you know, evapotranspiration comes from Simis data, um, or you know other other you know information um, from different um, state um, and federal resources um, for unique information specific to you know crops that are grown. Um, in the Nevada Irrigation District, we have crop reports from the district. We also have um, different, um, from the, both the state and the federal government, we have um, spatial land surface um, you know, data sets. So there's um, lots of different data that we're synthesizing and pulling together in this. And some of that is captured in the matrix um, that was distributed, and some of that is also, um, we'll highlight you know, some of those data sources in the, the remaining slides. Mm -hmm. So the evapotranspiration there, I mean, there's stations everywhere mm -hmm. in California that measure per crop how much the evapotranspiration per week it has been or will be. But I haven't seen one up here in Nevada County or for range land. Is there, is, is there a known factor for that or is there a way we can access that? There is um, spatial thinness, which um, uh, is basically um, it's a data product that's created by the, you know, the state from the CIMIS stations, yeah. um, and then basically interpolates between those based on information um, you know, about elevation and other factors that impact um, evapotranspiration. So that is a data set that we do have available. Okay, so there's not a there's not a station here, or is there? Is there? I haven't seen one. There's a station in there's a station in Auburn, and then there's an, not one directly in the Nevada Irrigation District. But there are similar. foothills. But there, are, yes, there are um, in the vicinity. Because in the Valley, I mean, yeah, you got them within miles of you. Yeah. So you know exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. Are you using a simulation? Oh, uh, the nearest simulation is in Brown Valley. It is. No. Oh. Thank you. Is spatial simulation or an um, open ET? Yeah. <laughs> we, is that at the, oh, excuse me. That's at the uh, extension? Station. Um, I'm, it's uh, there, so you can actually look up a map of some of the stations online. Uh, if you just Google Simmons um, and then just go to the first link. Uh, but it looks like it is located. Uh, station 84 located. Uh, what is that? Um, it is about three or four miles north of Highway 20, just to the east or sorry, west of. Uh, not labeled that. Um, uh, just uh, basically just west of the So that's the. Auburn does not have a station. Or sorry, no, it does. Uh, station 195. Uh, I can give you the latitude and longitude. <laughs> 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 uh, that was scavenger hunt. Uh, off of Ophir Road. Okay. Oh, down in the farm area. Good. So we do have a question from the public on the chat from LLP. Would NID sponsor ET stations through DWR? I don't think we've given that consideration, but possibly in the future we could look into it. One of the challenges with NID's service territory in particular is that conversation we had at the beginning of the plan for water process regarding the more parcel specific work that land IQ does when they actually deploy sensors, then they calibrate the data that they receive with the sensors with the data that Katie's referencing from the state to dial it down to the parcel by parcel level. Mm -hmm. From those conversations, we learned that our parcels and specifically as they relate to agriculture are really small 
and we have a lot of tree cover in part of the district. And then in the other part of the district where there is ag, it's very small that it wouldn't be able to deploy that many sensors to actually accurately calibrate the data. So they did recommend the process that we are using that Katie just referenced, and that's using the statewide data as opposed to trying to um, get it granular down to the parcel by parcel level because it just wouldn't be accurate. And in their opinion, they thought it would be a little bit of a waste of money. Good to know. Quite some time ago, we did actually work with the yard to try to get a station put into the road. find a viable spot. All right, I think we're ready, Katie. Okay, all right. Then um, moving on now into a bit more detail about the specific inputs to the demand model, again, focusing on um, key inputs. I, I suppose actually first we'll talk a little bit about the model structure. I think we got into a little bit before, but just to, um, to note that IDC operates on a grid, and that grid is tied to the parcel data within the Nevada Irrigation Distri District. So over time, um, you know, if land use has changed, that can be updated in the model just through a linkage to that parcel information. Um, and I guess just to, to you know, to note, um, you know, with the goals of this demand model being um, in part to preserve, you know, the spatial detail of where demand is occurring um, within the district and also um, to streamline the simulation of those different scenarios because we don't necessarily, you know, know what's going to happen in the future, but we do need bookends and we need to look at different scenarios and see how those um, slight changes in future conditions could change demand and impact demand. Um, so we'd like to streamline those simulations and then also, um, you know, in that same vein, um, allow for some easier updates to the model. Um, what we're recommending is the use of um, what's considered a unitized model. So basically um, creating a, a model that is able to simulate multiple scenarios at once, tie that to the, the land use data um, on the land surface, and then um, you know, do that for different um, elevation zones within the district. So basically looking at um, all the, the different combinations of the major characteristics that can impact demand um, and you know, what's happening spatially within the district. Is there a legend for this one question? Oh, no. So this is, it's, um, the, the, the figure here is um, more just a kind of an illustration um, to show that you know, linkages to different types of land uses within the district um, in the model. Um, just that, you know, just that showing the parcel detail in the district. Get your color. They're already colored. I just don't understand. <laughs> the colors don't necessarily don't make, make any representation in this particular figure. Oh, they, they are just okay. simply so that you have a visual reference of how many parcels there are. Yeah. Exactly. And, that, yeah. and that each one could be given a different assignment. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. In the future, when they go through their modeling effort, then we, you would be able to see the actual parcel designation provided to each parcel. This particular map wasn't intended for that. It's just so you have the magnitude of the number of parcels. You have soil. Um, <laughs> probably not a non-secular here. Anyway, uh, soil with high organic matter hold more, or holds greater amounts of moisture for longer periods. Mm -hmm. and therefore needs less water. So organic farmers are doing their bit to conserve water. Let's get that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, somehow he's going to get the best in this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All no, right. Today it's organic matter. Yeah. Today it's organic matter. <laughs> I think we're ready. Okay, perfect. Um, so now this is a point in the conversation where um, we get into a little bit more about the data sources of those key inputs. Um, but just you know, one final slide, kind of capturing again. There are lots of inputs to this model, and they're documented in the giant matrix um, that was distributed. If you and anyone in the audience, um, there are more copies here too. If you'd like a physical copy, um, you know, inputs to the model include um, land use, so developed land uses, you know, urban and different um, you know different types of urban. Land uses. Agricultural land uses different crops feed into the model, and then also the native and riparian vegetation. So, what are those kind of you know not developed, but um, you know use, uh, land uses that still require water, right? Um, urban water use is another um, key input. That's um, two inputs um, of focus here. Although there are some other inputs to the model, um, those two of focus here are population and per capita water use. So we'll talk a little bit about what our data sources are for that and what, um, you know, looking into the future, what the data sources for those projections are um, for those different scenarios. 
Um, and then agricultural water use, um, crop water demand, um, you know, how much water are different crops going to need over time, and then also irrigation practices, um, you know, what, what are the trends in irrigation practices? Um, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, one more question. Um, can you, sorry, the native and riparian vegetation, what are those sources again? Because if it's the land use impact that sort of implies that it's giving a water delivery, a specific intentional water mm -hmm. delivery, but that is distinct from agriculture? Or like what, what is that source? Or is that sort of get nestled under environmental water? Yeah, so um, the native and riparian vegetation as simulated in IDC and, you know, as we would be simulating it, um, is really going to be rain fed, you know, things that require just, you know, rain to survive. So, so those are things that are going to be in the model, but not necessarily something that's considered um, part of NID's demand per se. It's, it's, yes, yes. It's not on the demand side. It's no, but it's in the model. Yes. Within the exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So environmental demand is where? Oh, so um, back page right huh? on the back. See this? Yeah. And that gets factored but on the key inputs. I, I think that's this is a summary of the key inputs. I think what's really interesting is Katie Marco's team did a really good job. If you look at all of these different categories, right? These are the parameters that are covered in the model, and then when you get to the back. You see all these different sources of information, these, that's what the numbered footnotes are, that go into informing the parameters in the model. So, for example, for precipitation simulation, you know, there's a, a number of different sources of information and data that inform that model parameter. So, I think that the purpose of this table and this conversation is for people to have an opportunity to see where the data is coming from, what it's being used from, and then, you know, as some of the questions come up, if there's a better source of data, then that's, you know, what we're here to listen to and talk about. So, okay. Yeah, so I see environmental flows, and that's fine. Um, most of the farms I know have created habitat and maintain it with NID-delivered water. Um, is, is there a place you're going to input that? Not directly. Um, I guess the environmental flows, you know, at the beginning when we had those kind of five demand categories, that environmental side was um, the environmental, the in-stream flow releases, um, and that gets factored in to the plan for water process on the kind of the reservoir simulation side of the model. So it's not, that part is not simulated within IDC. Um, I guess I, I should note, you know, we we are simulating the land surface, so you know, to the extent that water is being delivered, and we have you know records of deliveries to to parcels and you know fields, and um, that water is being used for something. I mean, we we do you know we can factor that information into the um, you know, the different inputs that basically account for um, you know how much tail water there is, or how much water kind of gets held on farm or you know in the field. So that can get um, that can get simulated in that way. Yes. I think that what you're referencing is some of the smaller water use that's directly creating habitat on a parcel that we're considering agriculture. I think that it would be too granular of an area to be able to capture in the model. But there are raw water users, um, and Chip could probably tell you at the top of their head, that purchase large amounts of water. Who is it, Fish and Wildlife? Yep. It's fish and wild. So now Spent that, so. yeah, that could be captured. Something smaller you're doing on your parcel that does have a habitat benefit, that is too small to be able to capture in this level of a planning model. Okay, you finish. It won't be the BEPS. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I can appreciate that, except that I think when you multiply it out, per farm, per ranch, you're going to come up with a significant 20%, 25% being used for environmental purposes. And also, the the other factor is uh, the, the forest fires in 2020, what was 140 some billion, million metric tons of carbon was released in the <laughs> atmosphere. And all the savings between for the climate change adaptation up till then was 70 
one half of that. So a lot of our water goes for fire protection. I know that's not a beneficial, you know, use per se, but a lot of our water goes for fire protection and is actually environmentally used for that. So I think what we need to just remember is what we're looking at is what is our future demand and what is our future supply needs. <coughs> Although there are other beneficial uses within our existing water user base right. that in beneficially impact the environment or air quality or temperature that's not really what we're doing in this model because it would be conflating too many issues and I don't think we would get data out of it that you could use because we cannot get that granular. Okay, but as long as, and I'll be fine with that, okay, as long as we recognize that a lot of the water used on ranches and farms go into beneficial uses other than growing crops and, and environmental and that it's it's it is a beneficial use to this community. So, Katie, let's. I just want to confirm one item. So, the environmental flows that you referenced earlier, from a demand perspective, those are in reference to our required in-stream flows for our regulatory, a, a regulatory permit, such as our FERC licensing. So, from a demand perspective, our future demand would be our already agreed upon in-stream flows we've negotiated through our FERC license, and the additional flows associated with voluntary agreements. If there were to be additional environmental in-stream flow requirements for salmon reintroduction on the Yuba, then we can incorporate those into them all. For lands that are not currently connected to the system via raw water connection or treated water connection, they don't have a demand per se where you see their impact is on the supply side on how much water is running off. <laughs> Does that yeah. make more sense? Yeah, and I, I just, I guess my point is that don't think you can just tell us to irrigate to the root zone and we stop at where the roots are going and tell us that's all the water we're going to get for farming because that is going to have an environmental disaster effect on this community. We need more water for that than that for the environment. So this current exercise won't be utilized for a water budget per se. What would occur is that if our estimates for demand related to a specific land use type or crop type were way off, we could adjust that later in the model updates. And that's where that, that's really important to update every five years and then to do those annual report outs because the board will kind of understand, you know, we are really off on our assumptions water use skyrocketed because it's been super hot for the past 10 yeah. years. You know, and, those, that's where those discussions come in. And I come appreciate in. that. And, and I contrast, go down the valley, look at the sterile environment, the limited use of water for crop production only, monoculture, it won't work here. I also realize that we'll be calibrating this model too. Mm -hmm. So we'll be looking at how we deliver and what we deliver in those numbers historically versus what the model's projecting to see if they make sense, right? So we can make adjustments that way. So even though it may not be in that granular mode, it's being calibrated to the fact mm -hmm. that how we historically are using that water. Mm -hmm. And and that's the same with water loss will be calibrated based off of our actual deliveries and flows yeah. and releases. Okay. And that's why you have so many inputs on right. one right. model parameter. Well, I think this gives a good time to bring up my, my largest concern on the demand side, and that is that I see in several places on the matrix that we talk about um, this demand will be based on NID's historical delivery records, and you know this will be based on NID staff, and this will be based on the stimulated fraction of irrigation applied water will be confirmed with NID staff. And then in another spot, we talk it talks about the urban and ag water management plans, and uh, and uses of the crop reports and so on. And my concern is that. We do not, and this is a song I sing, we sing sometimes, we don't really know what, how much water is being used. We know what people self-report. <laughs> we know what we put in at the head and we know what the tail is, but we don't know what the actual needs are and we have not been ever able to demonstrate that. And so for the purposes of this model, I have a concern that if we use data that we know is incomplete, 
or in some cases inaccurate as we were told are the uh, ag and urban water management plans are, that then my fear is that we're going to be making a model based on incorrect or inaccurate data and that it will continue to, co to compound itself. And, you know, I don't know what the answer is because that's job, right? It's your job to figure out the answer, but how do we quantify what actually gets used and not just self-reported to you as the crop report? Sure. Well, on the land use side, um, you know, to go to crop reports, for instance, that's only one data source that we have. We do have um, other spatial data products. We have, you know, county land use surveys from multiple years into the past, so that's a good resource that we have. Um, we also have um, different spatial data sets from the state. Um, there's the Land IQ, if you're familiar with them, and their you know spatial um, mapping of of different land uses all across the state. That's another resource we have. Um, there's also um, information from um, you know the crop um, crop data layer, um, Cropscape, that is available from the USDA. So that's another spatial you know mapping of Can land you use. That? Could you maybe mm -hmm. take a not terribly deep dive, sure. just a little bit more dive so I can understand and others listening can understand what that is. Yeah, of course. So um, so those different kind of spatial land use yes, data sets land. that I'm talking about, I mean, those are really kind of ultimately they come from aerial imagery of kind of what's happening on the, the land surface and they look at kind of what the water use was. So they based on, you know, what it what it looks like basically from that imagery, you know, what they can correlate that back to what they, you know, think it most likely is on the land surface. Mm -hmm. And um, there is ground truthing to a lot of that. Um, the the county surveys, there's ground truthing to that too. Ground so, truthing. oh yes, I'm sorry. Uh, that's um, going in and making sure, you know, eyes on the ground. Is this actually well, an orchard? That's comforting yes. To hear mm -hmm. Because I didn't want it to only be a couple of sources, mm -hmm. which we know the accuracy of that. Some people could call sure. Question. Sure. So, I, I, I'll just give you an example of what I wanted to ask about. Um, so, I've got our, our crop report here just as an example. And um, so, it's fascinating. So, golf courses in our crop, crop report are 674.5 minus inches over almost a thousand acres. And so, is that how accurate? How do we know that that is in fact true? That it's not more or it's not less? And you're saying that you have a number of ways to verify that, including this ground truth thing and radar and all these sophisticated tools. Is that, in my understanding, that correct? Yeah. Um, and so that's on the land use side. We have those data sets. And then on the, um, you know, thinking about what kind of the, the demand from like an evapotranspiration mm -hmm. perspective, we also have um, various different sources for that. So that's where that the CIMIS data can come in. You know, that spatial CIMIS where we have this understanding of generally what the um, you know the evapotranspiration demand is um, in different areas for different crop types. So we can kind of merge these different data sets together to get our best assessment of what the actual water use was needed to actually, you know, irrigate and make it, you know, grow a healthy crop. But then there's also maybe some other uses of water too, right? You know, maybe there's, maybe we find that, um, you know, maybe they take, you know, someone takes 20% or 30% more water than they needed for evapotranspiration because they had many other things they were doing with that water. So that's where the calibration of the model, you know, comes into play as well. But we do have various data sources to come to our own estimate of what that um, not just relying on quote unquote historical exactly. data provided by yes. the Exactly. Okay. We, we have our, our own means of coming. Uh, I do want to make a comment. So, based off of our water rights, we do and are legally required to monitor mm -hmm. our water use and deliveries very carefully, and they are monitored all the way downstream to the next reservoir. I know, it's a further discussion. No, but it is, it's yeah. a very important fact because it's not something that is just willy-nilly done. We do no. know the amount of water that is delivered. We have to specifically report to on it. Box. Pardon? To the box? No, from, through our reservoir. So I think there's a little bit of a, um, we're, we're going back to conflating some issues, right? Yeah. So as Katie was just describing, when we go through and look at demand on a parcel by parcel basis, there's a lot of different inputs they are taking in based off of what they know about the land use today mm -hmm. and what our assumptions are going to be about the land use into the future, right? There's two variables that, it's predictive. that I think are missing, and maybe I'm wrong. Uh, so my experience is this all sounds great, absorption, whatever, land use, but people want access and cost. And they're going to buy water based on those two things. And 
me and all my neighbors do that, right? If you could give me four more miters inches, I'd buy it today. And if it was twice as expensive, I'd buy half as much, right? So it, it, does your model look into the, the consumer side of the demand other than just looking at what the, the actual soil could be used for or is being used for? That is based off of when, when Doug works with the team to go through any additional connections in the soft service area or apply, uh, providing additional water. We look at, is it feasible? How far is it? Is there a moratorium because of the size of the canal or there's some type of canal restraint? I think one thing we have to remember is we're looking at supply and demand for an entire district. Mm -hmm. When we manage water, and it's not just an ID, whether it be a city or another irrigation district, you man we manage a system as a whole. It takes us days to move water from up top mm -hmm. to down bottom. So when, it, when we start talking about large supply and demand, this individual water use really doesn't, if Rich rips out his pumpkins today and puts in almonds tomorrow, it's not really going to change what we're doing all that much. Would you, so I think we're just getting wrapped a little too random, so wrapped around the axle. Is the, the granularity of what's actually being done in that soil per um, uh, plot of land is less important than bigger factors that we should be focused on? Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. We, soil type's important. I mean, I'm going to look to the expert, Katie and Marco, know better than I do, but soil type, temperature, amount of precipitation, you know, when you get into we make some general assumptions about about crop use, but that could change, right? So when you're yeah, doing a 50-year right. plan, right. You, we can update it, but what would we update it? Maybe every five years? Yeah. So, so you have to look at the significance of it. The demand per parcel, I'm more concerned with the existing customers. Is There are people who want more water, but it's either too expensive or they don't have access. Their pipe will only give them one one inch or the ditch will only have one inch. those sorts of things i would rather um, when we get into the kind of myopic view that we we address before we look at expanding to parcels that aren't being serviced and, and that's a policy discussion right so we're talking about the soft service territory and then you know the board can make some decisions do we focus on increasing water deliveries to existing folks is that off the table? Do we only look at expansion to soft service areas that are within 100 feet, or is it a thousand feet, or what is it? Do you have a question here? Well, so, so directly answer your question. IDC doesn't have an economic component to it. You can look at that kind of after you run the model, but it's, the model's already so complicated that they haven't. Well, if, it, if it's in the noise, like Jennifer said, then I'm not as concerned until we look at, at what we're going to do as far as supporting the existing co customers. Because yeah. I know people are cutting back because they can't afford the water today. And if a rate increase happens, people will cut back more. So we should at least have that as a concern before we start looking at, at accessing additional properties that may not even have access to a ditch today. One of, uh, one thing to add, one of the limitations of these models, they have what's called perfect foresight. So they, you, you, know, you give the field, this is the demand, and you meet that exactly. So there's no, you know, farmer A does this, farmer B does this, farmer C does this. You can build rules into the model to kind of model that, but it's pretty difficult, and there's just as much uncertainty as not doing that. Um, so that is one of the limitations is, you know, the model says, this is how much water this field needs, and the farmer meets that perfectly. So, okay. And so that's where the calibration part yeah. comes in, right? Yeah. Which is, the model will dictate that, and then we look at what we actually would have delivered in that specific scenario, and if it's off by a huge amount, then we need to make some adjustments to the model. Whereas if it's relatively close, yeah. then we know that those assumptions seem to be jiving with what was actually happening in the real world. Now we can use those assumptions to go forward into the future and expect something to be reasonable. There is no infrastructure planning model that has ever been actually right, right? <laughs> so, it, it, I, I think at least in South class or how many rainbirds can I drive at the same time is more important than how much <laughs> is that ground going to absorb. That's how people plan their irrigation yeah. systems for irrigate faster. And, and some of the issues are there's a difference between what people say they will do and what actually happens. 
we haven't, to my knowledge, have had a whole lot of decreases in raw water accounts due to rates. We haven't had a rate increase in two years. Not last year, not this yeah. year, was, so far. Were there any decreases in the last five years? Like no, I have, there have been, but I think they've been drought. Yeah, they're drought. Mm -hmm. Let me get to a couple of these public comments. So, Mr. Feldman, under land use, are horse pastures considered as agricultural or any other use? Pasture um, would be considered an agricultural. It gets bundled under that um, if it's irrigated. All right. If it's irrigated, it's bundled under ag. Well, there, I, I, I would say it is bundled under ag. Um, within ag land uses, you know, there's pasture, there's, mm. but there's also maybe it's a title. It's crop type. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's, a crop, it. not it's considered a crop type because it's the type of grass. Okay. I'm going to do another one. Peter Burns, relying on self-reported data requires auditing to be credible. I think that's more of a comment. How, Ms. Sheehan, hi Tracy, how will the model or use of the model address changes in crop types or changes in the extent of crops over time, including the possibility of decreases in crops or hypothetical crop dynamics over time? This gets to our five-year update. So we would be planning on updating a minimum of every five years, the model. It is a good issue, though, mm -hmm. a lot of um, agriculture can't be grown if we continue to it, I mean, it's, more yeah. it's not so much necessarily the heating up, it's the, the lack of cold. cold. Well, that's for, your peonies are an example. Yeah. No. Or except that there are plans to transplant mandarins and lemons up here that will now grow. So there's a transition and transformation. And, and so in one, out the other, they'll keep just dynamic. And uh, given the world's food insecurity, we're going to be growing more food here. Uh, how will we account for losses associated with p existing ponds? Are those captured or do they have to be a, a minimum size? Um, ponds are another potential land use that can be simulated in the model. And so there are um, means of basically having inflows and outflows you know, simulated. Would we make some limitation on the ponds we would actually simulate because they're s small ponds, I'm guessing, aren't going to move the needle on that yeah, it, I think so. I mean, I, I, if it's, you know, a small pond on um, an area that's, you know, receiving water for irrigation of some crop, I mean, I think that entire area will just be simulated as that crop and then our understanding of how much water is taken, whether it's put into the pond or whether it's put on the field, um, that kind of gets absorbed within the, you know, like the granularity of the model. Uh, it could be a stock pond, mm -hmm. could be an irrigation pond, could be fish. Mm -hmm. You have to be uh, careful, otherwise you're double counting. <laughs> Let's count it. Ultimately, no. though, we know the demand for each of those parcels, in other words, how much they are purchasing, and we can factor that in, and it, it, it gets yeah. into the variables and the shift of the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, here's a question, follow-up. Is it ag supposed to be income producing? I, I'm unclear what if that is referencing the ag operation itself, whether ag is income producing or not, or are you referencing NID revenue? Maybe Mr. Feldman, you could follow up in the chat. And then last public question. Oh, Mr. Feldman was asking about recreational horses versus food like. livestock. We don't necessarily make a distinguishment between that. And a lot of those recreation are used in ranch type operations. Some aren't, but you know, a lot of them that you look like, oh, that's recreational out there. No, they're using them and they use for roundups or or hurting the, the herds. You know, that's, and I, you know, I kind of keep going back to this. So this is a planning model and the accuracy of a planning model is based off of all these inputs and then the assumptions that are made on the data and how it's applied to our district. Yeah. And so as Katie explained, they go through a very thorough process of taking and overlaying a variety of data sources and then calibrating it with the data that we have collected in the actual precipitation, water deliveries, reservoir operations to start calibrating and see if any of those are off. 
So because of that, remember, all models, no model is perfect, no answer is perfect, and that's why we're going to really be committed to those annual report outs and then the five-year update. I want to get too worked around the axle about whether, you know, if I had 10 horses, which I wish I did, if my 10 horses were just for petting and feeding carrots to, or if they were for ranch use. I think we're in, in the weeds a little bit too much because of the big picture versus yeah. well, the farmer will consider his horses not an agricultural crop. But for our purposes, we're irrigating pasture that people are herding their horses, are pasturing their horses on. So that's agriculture. That's a role that's an ag use, right? <clears throat> getting into the water, that's, yeah, start getting down into should we be in allowed water use for that kind of stuff, I think is where this discussion is kind of going. And, uh, I think we need to stick to the big picture. The bigger picture of our current demand. What is we're not where it's going to what it's doing when it gets there. But whether and make a judgment or not make a judgment about right. yeah, whether it refers to recreational or not. Right? Well and remember it doesn't matter. We don't care what you're doing with the horses. We care if you're watering the land. Right, right, right. right. And the okay. horses are so, and Mr. Burns wants to say to say there's strictly no recreational horse pasture is not credible. Which we we, we know that there that. is. We yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think we're I got a big picture comment. <laughs> okay. I just would like to kind of go back to Ricky's point about the um our the annual survey that we do, and I mean no disrespect to ID on this, but I am a real skeptic on that survey because I think it is it requires no active anything on the part of our ratepayers. You know, you get it and so if you want the same amount of water, you don't you don't change the crop report. So I just I my understanding, Katie, is that you have the crop report as one element of input, but if the validation of that happens through looking at USDA reports, which are also incomplete. Yeah. Um, and and other land use uh, tools mm -hmm. that help you to see factually do they have an acre of apples yep. or mandarins or not? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and every you know every data source has its uncertainty, and so that's where you know we try to bring together as much as we we can of what we think are um, good data, you know, and then see how those you know if they, if they all align, well that's great, you know we you know. Probably, I feel pretty sure about what that yeah. is. But if they're all, you know, if they're different, then that's where, um, you know, the more credible data sources, um, you know, need to be weighed more heavily than maybe that. Like, if the crop reports aren't considered credible, then that's maybe, you know, something that we need to just note and, you know, keep in mind as we're comparing that. So. Well, I'm comforted by the fact that you have seen more than the crop reports for and like historical records, which are largely no
guess we have to narrow down a little bit more about what is actually being used. Well, that could be wrong. Yeah, right? that I think we're we're back to this is a this is a question that comes up a lot, and I yeah. I do know that it is it gets extremely complex very fast. Mm -hmm. So okay. the purchase of 20 minor inches for Mr. Beerwagon, I mean, I don't even know what that it is. It, that's what it is. But that is a mechanism for billing and revenue recovery that does not equate directly correlate to our demand numbers. Our demand numbers, like in the urban water management plan, are based off of water actually sold and then some percentage increase placed on the top. It has nothing to do with the billing factor. So for raw water, we have essentially a fixed fee and the revenue recovery associated with that fixed fee, that's all that 20 minor inches is associated with. It's a way for us to distribute customer classes and have revenue recovery and set rates. For treated water, you'll have a fixed fee and then a volumetric fee, mm -hmm. which collectively together complete that revenue recovery. When we set the fixed fee for treated water, it's based off of a meter size, which could be five eighths inch, three quarters inch, one inch, four inch, two inch. You can put more water through a three quarters inch meter or a one inch meter than we equate when we are going through and making fee calculations based off of a one inch meter. So don't get those two confused based off of this conversation, supply and demand, and how we sell water. They're two different things. Yeah, see, I, I wasn't thinking of it as how we sell water. It wasn't an economic thing on my part. It's just like, well, you know, when you buy a miner's inch, you buy 24 7 through the irrigation season, right? That's not how we're, that's but not how we're calculating. It's available. But that's not how we calculate demand. Understood. Okay. And so my, my point is, is if we took this giant list of everybody who was self-reporting on the crop report X minors inches, and you went, well, what is really being used out of there? Oh, it's, well, it's actually, what's really needed is Y. And then what is the difference? Is it more or less? The crop report isn't used for that. The crop okay. report is used for the type of crop, which right. equates to how much water they need to sustain the crop, right. not the crop and the size of the account. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of it as a surprise account. I was trying to equate it with water. Go ahead. Rich? Patiently, about 15 minutes, but that's all right. Um, two things. One, we've had a program for two years that anybody, if you had 20 year miners inches, you could give up five or 10 if you weren't gonna use them this year, but you did not lose the right to the 20 for future years. That program kind of adjusts some of those people who may not be planting as much one year as the next, but it does, it does take up some of that excess you're talking about. The other thing, the uh, bigger picture to me, you're going to use the crop report. The crop report in Nevada County is way understated. That's number one. The second part of it is that the homestead, you have to have, I think, a USDA de definition of a farm is that you need to sell $1,000 worth of product a year. So a lot of homesteads, ranch ranchettes, produce a lot of food here. And it's very hard to measure how much food is produced because they're sharing with their neighbors, they're canning, they're, you know, however that works, it never enters into the system where it's accounted for. So when you look at, wow, these ranchettes are getting, well, a lot of guys are growing food and they're sharing it in the community or they're donating it to Interfaith or Food Bank. So I guess be aware that that's a way understated figure and it's gonna be hard to calculate. And that's why it's just one component of the information she right. looks at for good crop know. type or land use. It's good to know it's just one. Yeah. Wanted to Go ahead. Uh, I want to chime in about the, the uh, 150 year old service delivery system that we have. And Jennifer pointed out a year ago already when she came here that uh, the only way to solve this, this challenge that we're discussing is to have one every, every raw water gets run pressurized pipe with a meter, right? And I have to buy extra water in order to run, if I'm gonna run 15 sprinklers in an orchard, I have, to, I have to buy enough to run those 15 sprinklers, even though I don't run it 24-7, right? I have five service entrances on my property side. That's a huge problem on our place. It has been 
but the water is in an expensive tree. So you're right. How much, <clears throat> how much am I actually using in that 20 inches? However, given the, the, these constraints, but they're, they're <coughs> yeah. without building a huge reservoir on top of the mountain myself, which I have done. It's, it's a real challenge. So that's part of the part of that discussion is the how much is actually needed, how much is it actually needed. <clears throat> Critical mass. Thank you. Yeah. Critical point. You need yeah. Jennifer, I feel like you're trying to share that the, the demand calculation is independent, at least for in your mind, at least for the model, independent from the consumption model. You, you, you they're they're all informed. I think we're just getting a little bit confused on what when we say two minors inches or three quarter inches, and we apply these volumes to it. They are based off of a customer class in a whole. So there's people who use less and people who use more. We're pigeonholing them into customer classes, and it it can help inform demand models because we have an idea of how we're splitting revenue through a rate model versus how Katie's whole demand model and how those two mesh. So we can always kind of say, okay, well, we generally per miner's inch are selling this much water. You can continue to calibrate that down, but it's not going to change your actual demands. So it's the same thing with the sewer plant. And I think this might be easier to understand. So with sewer plants, Sewer, sewage is not metered, and the reason why, and it's, uh, it's real similar to raw water, is those those types of flow-through meters like that, they will get clogged. They're not very accurate. You know, toilet paper gets stuck on it or wh whatever it is, moss from the canal. So you, you, it's not needed to size a treatment plant because that's not how we manage the treatment plant. We manage it as a whole, so we're watching huge amounts of data come in through big meters, not at the individual residential base. Because even with, so when we go through and we set fees for new connections, so one equivalent dwelling unit from a planning purpose is 12,050 gallons per day. That's just an estimate of what the average is. People are using a lot less and people are using a lot more. And then remember the equivalent dwelling unit doesn't actually correlate completely to a meter size. Then do a further calculation and do an equivalent meter size. And that's how you start to develop rate models to recover revenue. We've been really wrapped around the axle about what is 20 miners inches and what are you using and they're not using 20 miners inches for the demand conversation. It doesn't, it's not really going to move the needle on our conversation at this point. The, the technology isn't quite there, our system isn't quite there, and it really won't matter if we continue to ca calibrate our model based off of these larger data sets on the five-year basis. Where that type of information would be valuable would be targeted conservation, mm -hmm. some of those types of things but not so much for this larger scale demand model. You have to put it always in the perspective of how we move water. We start moving water from the top to the bottom and what does it take? Three days? At least three days to move it through. What Ricky does on her parcel, what Rich does on his parcel, doesn't even remotely matter to us. It's too time delayed. Yeah, when we establish the system, we don't look at how much our total customers have purchased and put mm -hmm. that in the canals on day one. No, we don't do that at all. We actually look at real-time demand and try to match those up. So a prime example of that is at the beginning of the irrigation season, we're not even close to the full purchase allotment that our customers have purchased because they're not using it and we know it because the canals are showing excess at the end, so we cut back. And then as we roll into the August months when it's hot and dry, now people are getting close to their full allotment of purchase and those Purchase allotments are very much closer to what we're actually putting into the system. Now, where we measure and we're very precise on what we measure is how much we're putting into the system, and we need to be precise with that because that's where our water rights are at, and we want to manage those canals as best we can. So we do our best to measure at the head and also at the end. We're not necessarily measuring each individual customer along the way other than a maximum work. You, we'll even look at things. Chip and his team are really good at saying, okay, it's it's September, it's hot, but oh, we see this big storm coming. or So we can start ratcheting water back because we know a big storm's coming. Or it has been so hot, August, September, October, it's boiling still. 
once we start wetting those canals up, they're so dry, we have to put more water in than we normally would just to wet them up because water's infiltrating. <coughs> so the system just simply isn't managed on a customer by customer basis. No, we look at climate, temperature, um, you know, the highest water use is in August when it's, it's the days are super long and if you get, you know, 10, 100, five degree greater days in a row, people start using a lot of water. And those are the things how we manage the system, not based off of what an individual person does. Let me just grab and keep the- I, I was just gonna say, and again, that's where the calibration part the comes calibration in, right? They're, they're developing a demand on the parcels. We don't have that information, but we have the information on what it takes to deliver water to those parcels. So that's when they can look at that information and their demand numbers and what we're putting in plus all the losses on our canals and everything. Are they lining up? Or if they're way off, we need to make some additional assumptions to make sure that what we're physically doing on the ground is matching what they're projecting the demand model should be doing. Then we feel confident in the, do in the model, we can project forward into the future. Amen. So that's, that's the key. They're, they're being parcel specific in some aspects. We're not that way, but that's where the calibration comes in to make there sure that their information makes sense in terms of the usage. All of this data comes together to make the best assumptions and the right. best predictions. It's not, like I said, it's not going to be correct, right. but it's valuable, especially if you calibrate it and update it every five years. Okay, we have just one quick comment from um, Laura Peters. The answers to all questions should be documented in text. Um, anonymous attendee, is the goal to estimate actual irrigation use or continue with purchased amounts? I think we just had a nice long conversation yeah, about that. That. <laughs> that was helpful though. Thank you. It's like automated. Is this operational data available to the public? I'm not sure which, maybe um, anonymous, you can specify specifically what operational data you're referencing. All right, anybody else before we go on? A quick question for Chip. So Chip, at, at those primary exit points at the tail for the whole system, um, do we have, some of those are automatic, automated reads and some are not? Uh, the majority of them are manual reads still. We are not up to speed on full automation on the tail. The heads, we're, we're progressing better than the tail. Yeah. Those are just distribution operators that I'll do. And how often do they go to visit the tails? It depends on the route, but if they know it's a, a large canal with a lot of customers, they'll do daily. We're buying two of them this year, automated. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly a move the district needs to go in, is more automation, more automating metering, but on a larger scale, not on the parcel by parcel. Right. Yeah. Thank you. The, the Anonymous attendee would like to know the accurate demand data captured by NID operations as referenced by CHIP. Is that available for the public? Uh, well, basically, we, we yeah. put that data in all of our uh, raw water master plans and that we submit to the state, and yes, that's on our webpage. It's on our webpage as well. All right, Katie. <laughs> Right, well, I mean, the next few slides, I think we've already talked about quite a bit of this, because from here, <laughs> and to, you know, data sources, and honestly, I think we've well, covered a lot of this, but um, so to start out with um, land use, just to reiterate, we have these different land use mapping um, and survey data. We also have the crop surveys, um, but they are not the only data source. Um, they are just one piece of that puzzle. And looking to the future, um, we have the soft service areas information. Um, we also have general plan and zoning information. We know kind of generally where urban development could happen. I mean, it wouldn't happen everywhere, obviously. So that's one factor that goes into the future um, projections of land use changes. And then also we have projections from the USGS and then also um, you know, recent trends um, from these other data sources that we have um, historical data for. So not sure that there's uh, more questions there, but if there are, we can stop. Don't ask for questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, population is another um, another key piece that we wanted to highlight here. Um, historical data we have 
um, from the California Department of Finance, and that um, we have quite good data for that for cities and counties, and that's on an annual basis. We also have, of course, census data. Um, and then looking to the future, we have population projections that come from also the California Department of Finance. And we also, um, actually in the December 21st meeting, we learned that there is also um, a separate population projection for this area from the Nevada County um, Transportation Commission um, from a, a road study that they did. So that's another piece that we are looking into. Um, and then also um, projected connections just to have the nexus between um, this planning effort and the urban water management planning effort. Um, that was another you know, piece of information that we have. And um, this is, I guess, one point where we thought um, this would be a good opportunity to just kind of talk um, back to those bookends, you know, looking at the different scenarios. We don't know what exactly is going to happen. We can, you know, look in the crystal ball and, you know, we just don't know. Um, but we can, you know, have a couple of assumptions um, and look at different scenarios. Um, so what we're planning to do are these sensitivity analyses to look at those potential bookends from kind of the, you know, minimum change to the maximum change and will likely fall somewhere in between. So we just wanted to kind of highlight that here, but I think that's something that we've discussed um, throughout this presentation. Um, and then finally, uh, urban water use here, we have um, historical data. This, is, this gets into the, um, the per capita water use. We have, of course, the potable water production data um, from the cities and from NID and also you know, reported to the State Water Resources Control Board. So we have data on that. And then looking to the future, we have, um, of course, you know, recent historical trends in per capita water use with you know, maybe increasing um, conservation or you know, changes there. Um, and then we also have per capita targets into the future just from a regulatory standpoint. So those are factors also being considered in the projection for the urban water use. Um, and with that, I mean, there are many more inputs, as you, as you are aware and as you saw with the big matrix. Um, there's not enough time to go through all of those perhaps today, but, you know, if there are questions um, that you have or, if, you know, as you're reading through that, um, you're welcome to, you know, reach out and we can, um, you know, clarify the information going into the model. And this is also, um, you know, a, a process that is going to be calibrated um, and there's also um, opportunity for, you know, more feedback and presentation as the model is um, being developed to relay information to you about, you know, if, if, if there were any changes to what is in that matrix, we can relay that information to be sure that nothing's happening, you know, behind closed doors. Um, and just to note, you know, the ongoing coordination with um, NID as well as stakeholders. Um, and then also just to note that um, there is an IDC update um, that was presented in July. So as the model, um, you know, becomes fleshed out, um, there will be another, another formal presentation then. Um, and with that. We have two questions, and they're both along the same line. So, um, it sounds like some of the population growth you are going to utilize Department of Finance projected growth numbers. It's out, there is some concern over that. One concern is, does the data include high, low, and best guess estimates? Will the model accommodate a negative growth scenario even if DLS estimates do not include a negative growth estimate? Will the model show a range of outputs based on the range of estimates? In addition to the DOF growth estimates, are you, you, we are also going to be speaking with the local land use agencies related to their population growth projections. And this is one of those things, I know it's very sensitive from a modeling perspective, um, also from establishing fees. Growth is always something that really can drive your model numbers. For us, it's not going to be so much because of the percentage of, you know, large growth is really related to in this area to residential growth, which is a very small water user versus raw water growth. So for the DOF estimates, um, those will be used in conjunction with information we receive from the land use agencies. And people are all over the board on those, right? So you can look at population growth trends over the last decade, and then you can somewhat calibrate it and inform that conversation more with the land use agencies and the growth projections that they're using. And then, you know, when you get into Plaster County, the developers drive a lot of the conversation um, because it does help with their impact fees. Mm -hmm. And so they'll say they're going to have 5% growth year over year. So it is, it's a balance. You have to take all the information and make some of those reasonable assumptions, but that really can help you with also some of your scenario development, right? And so there's been conversations I know that I've had with President Hull, well, Nevada County really doesn't seem to grow that fast. 
maybe you know there's a smaller growth factor placed into the urban areas with the Nevada County than there is in Placer County. Um, and, and it's just going to have to be kind of an informed conversation that isn't completely based off of the Department of Finance. Right, that's part of the infill part, right? A little yeah. more unique than some of the big cities mm -hmm. where they, they just grow in blocks and it's pretty straightforward where we may have five miles of pipeline and half of the customers aren't connected. So even if our population doesn't change one person, we may get an additional growth spurt because those folks as well as go bad, et cetera, that they start tying into it. Oh, and maybe that's really slow or doesn't happen, right? So that's where you kind of come right. up with the book in. You know, how many how many people from the Dussleys are going to connect? <laughs> and how quickly? Yeah. So, you know, those are conversations, right. but it's all valid. And this, I think, points to just one source of data it isn't always the best when you're modeling. You have to inform all data, you know, take it in collectively to come up with a well-informed assumption. Okay, Tracy also has a question. How will the model address conversion of agricultural water to urban water use or the reverse as land use changes? Well, that gets factored in um, it, through, through land use changes. So, yep. you know, land use ties to the, to the model calculation. So if land use is changing, then the calculation for that land use is converted from ag to urban that would be part of the five-year update stuff where you start oh. to look at that too, right? Where right, we had it exactly. as one thing and now yep. five years later we see that it's not yes. a division of vice versa. So we look at current land use and then we look at future general plans and if the land use is changing significantly like from ag to urban, which would drop the water demand a lot, um, then we would have to make, that goes into the absorption calculation on when do we think those residential units would come online so that we could say at what what year in the planning horizon we think those demands are going to drop due to the switch from ag to urban. I thought it was one to one almost. Ag in ag in urban? No. No. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I have I have a lot of experience in this yeah, area. She has the numbers, <laughs> yeah. And it's not one to one. No, it's not. Okay. I don't know off the top of my head, but the amount of water for when you um, and we can pull some data. Actually, Lincoln's the, one of the I mean, best Lincoln's areas. Six yeah. homes to the acre, four people per acre or per home, and that's about what two thirds of a acre foot per home. Yeah. 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 This is where that that seventy thirty comes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If, if, when, when you convert from ag urban, you do dramatically drop. You drop. There's also a difference between consumptive use and just water use, right? Mm -hmm. so most domestic use is not consumptive use. It's not being lost in the atmosphere. Um, it may be lost because it's you know, no longer potable, uh, but it can go back in the ground. Um, be. be reused elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I see no more public questions. Anybody here? Move to adjourn. I have, I have a question, Jennifer. So we have an update coming in July. That's related to the mob, right? So there's a, a meeting on the IDC update, and that's in July. Our next meeting will be before July. I plan for water. Yeah. 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 I'm just wondering, I, I maybe you could help me understand, will we be hearing from Katie between now and July? Yeah, I think we'll have some different... Mm -hmm. um, as we go along, we'll have different inputs, different comments or questions on okay. input like what do you, what, how do we want to how do we want to look at a specific piece or something so that they, we can put that information. In. Well, and then often what happens once you know the model team can't build infinite amount of scenarios; they would never stop modeling. So one of the things once the demand model is built, then we'll have a really good understanding on which of those levers really moves the needle on demand. And then we could come back and say, okay, these are the scenarios we want. We want to show it's going to be 110, 10 months a year, you know, or we're going to get all of our rain in one, in one month. In one month. <laughs> Um, or, you know, whatever growth is going, we're going to have our soft service growth is going to occur at a rate of 25% year over year versus zero. 
we'll start knowing what those levers are that really move the needle on the dial, so then that will help us determine our bookend scenarios mm -hmm. and then any other scenarios in the middle. Okay. That's really great. Thank yeah. you. And thank you, Katie. Yep. And then you get your name, sir. Oh. Marco. Marco, thank you. So we have a question from Peter Burns, and I don't know if it's completely applicable to um, this particular presentation, but I will read anyways. Let's say Nevada and Placer counties decide to recreate the Bay Area here, bringing in 10 million residents in the next 20 years, building 20 and 30-story office and condo towers, vast subdivisions, universities, commercial, industrial complexes, freeways, etc. Will NID, PCWA always just say, okay, no problem, plenty of water. We'll get right on that. At one point, does NID, PCWA say no, can't do? It's all assumed that there will never be any limit to available water resources imposed on envisioned plan development. So this goes, this is a common concern that people have, and it's a little bit of a confusion regarding land use authority and how general plans are set. So when they do a new general plan and set land use, there does have to be an environmental analysis completed and a water supply analysis completed, and those do have to substantiate. There's even, what is it, AB 1600, or what is the study? Oh, for the water. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the one that we just did for the mine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. There are there's a variety of state laws that would prevent that from any of those things from occurring if there was no water supply because there would be unmitigated you know unmitigated environmental impacts. They wouldn't be able to demonstrate their water supply. Um, they wouldn't have approval through LAFCO to make those changes. So, I think the likelihood is not high that that would occur. We do not have the authority to say there's no more water. No, we can. We can put a moratorium on new water deliveries in our system. But, you can do that at any time. But if we have water, if we have water, correct. I mean, the board could say, the board could say we are hereby dedicating the rest of our water supply, excess water supply, to environmental uses. You could do that, and then put a moratorium on the rest. And then we'll be in court for how long? I don't. But anyone with four hundred dollars can sue anyone. <laughs> All right, Peter has one more question. What about undeveloped water? So, you know, I'm not sure what that's referring to, undeveloped groundwater or surface water, but those are also controlled through a variety of sources. What is expected land use area resolution from the DWR open ET or land IQ 0.24 or 0.02 acres? I think we'll have to get back to you on that question. We can we can share. I mean, there is a link to those data sources in the matrix, so that information is available. Oh, so we we'll refer to the matrix. Okay. Oh, great. Right. And the matrix is online. Or if there's if there's not, yeah, that avail that information is available online. But there should be a there should be. We can find some of that information and point it out. All right, so our next meeting will be next month, and stay tuned. Yes, thank you all for coming and participating. And thank you, Katie and Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you.